You're listening to the Clear Creek Resources Podcast from Clear Creek Community Church. To hear more, check out clearcreekresources.org. All right, so we are going to jump to some of these questions here. Uh, she says all of them. We are not going to get to all of them, but we'll do our best to do uh, what we can here. So yeah. question number one, there is a couple different versions of this question on here, um, and it has more to do with the series, the Revelation series, and less to do so with what you presented tonight. So everything I said I wasn't going to talk about and ask questions about? Uh, it's more like how we, how we approach Revelation. Right, so here we do go. It. So how do you determine what to take literally mm-hmm. in Revelation? It seems like we've been chalking a lot up to symbols. Well, I mean, for, for us, again, I think it all comes back to the genre of literature. Um, I mean, it's apocalyptic in its genre, which means it deals in images and it deals in symbols. And uh, rarely, I mean, you can, you can look at the language uh, in the same kind of material at that same era. So John writes, I think Revelation around 95 AD, that wasn't the first apocalyptic work that had been out. It actually, there were a ton of apocalyptic works that had been out. <clears throat> and that was kind of the style of the age. That was what was popular. And John takes a popular way to, to write and, and employs it. Now, that genre just uses image. It, everything is symbolic in it. That's just the nature of the writing itself for the genre. And so what you see in the Old Testament as literal gets spiritualized in the New. But Jesus already said stuff like that. He would say, like, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, like, you know, the, it literally says if, you, if, you, um, if you, you shouldn't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look at someone with lust in your eye, you've already committed. I mean, he raises everything up. Um, Hebrews talks about, here, here's an example. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that when the Bible talks about that, I don't remember what the passage is, where it says that, um, I want to say it's, I don't know, I want to say First Corinthians, but I'm not sure. I put some notes down here, but it's always helpful when I just scribble stuff on my page and nothing happens. Um, <laughs> 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, for all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Well, which promises are those? It says all the promises. So imagine, how many promises did God give the early fathers of Israel, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David? Right? He gave them all these covenants, all these promises, and yet the New Testament looks back on the Old Testament and says they're all fulfilled in Jesus. And that's not even literally. I mean, Jesus literally isn't a piece of land. He's not, uh, shockingly, not literally a lamb either. He's, he is spiritually those things. And that's what we actually see in Revelation. Jesus is a lamb. But we know he's not a bleating lamb like a little lamb. We know that he's not either a door. He's not any of those things. But in Revelation, it's all been spiritualized. But even in the New Testament, we see that. I mean, think about... When it says, uh, because I understand the argument, hey, if it was a literal promise, it's gotta be fulfilled literally in the New Testament, but no, it doesn't. Sometimes if you look at the Old Testament, it wasn't even fulfilled literally. When it says he'd give them all the land, and then when they got there, it says you now have all the land, but funny how they didn't run out all the enemies. Like there's patches of land they still didn't own, and God said it's been fulfilled, but they didn't have every square inch of it. So there, even in the Old Testament, some things weren't fulfilled literally. It gets very cherry-picking when so, well, this is literal and this wasn't, and every promise God ever fulfilled was literal. Not really, unless you're going to say literally it's in Jesus. Uh, in Hebrews, what does it say? It says that Abraham then pursued the heavenly city. What? I thought he was one a piece of land. That's what God told him in Genesis. But it says that they were looking for something beyond that. You know why? Because those things were types. It's a theological term. <clears throat> They were, they were copies, they were patterns, they were echoes of the real substance in Jesus. And so that's why when we get to Revelation, it all funnels in on Jesus. All those things unfold. Notice he's the lamb, he's the temple, he's the great high priest, he's the sacrifice of the high priest. He's actually the temple where the priest sacrifices the lamb. He's all of it. And so this was even mind-blowing to the Jews themselves in Jesus' day when Jesus was like, I am the temple. Tear this bad boy down in three days. He did say bad boy. He says, tear this guy down in three days, I'll rise it from, and they didn't know what he's talking about. Because they're literal. And Jesus was talking about something much different. Now you could say, well, it was literally a resurrection, and I give you that. Uh, but there's, there's all of that within the New Testament itself that has it spiritualized. <clears throat> I mean, um, in, in fact, um, what, what, what Goldsworthy would say, and I think this is right, what, what God was doing is what was the piece of land that, that Israel wanted and knew? Canaan. That's Israel's what they wanted. But for them, it was just a, it was a copy of something greater, which is what? What is... Um, 
can't remember, it's not Zechariah. I don't know which text it is right now. It says that there will come a day where all the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. That, that's, that's the end game. We're not, we're not wrestling for a piece of land in the Middle East. Uh, Jesus is coming for all of it. That's what he's coming for, all of it. And it ain't just the earth. It's a whole new cosmos. So everything gets get ratcheted up, but the language that John uses is inherently symbolic. He even says it's symbolic. Now we saw today, things like frogs came out of their mouths. What you probably, I hope you don't think frogs came out of the mouths. Because then he later says, and these are the demonic hordes. Oh, now I gotta, I gotta, I gotta change that, it's not the frogs. So, um, but if you wanna take that it's all literal, by all means, go ahead and do it. That is an interpretive way to do That is a way to do it interpretively. But even the most literal people in Revelation don't take it all literally. That's why you have helicopters as locusts and not locusts that are going around stinging people and killing them. I haven't found one person on any spectrum that believes that. But if you believe that there's going to be demon locusts coming around stinging people, you're more than welcome to believe that. I re- I'm sincere in that. I, I really, there's, there's just reason why. Um, what have we done throughout this whole series? We've showed you how John is taking concepts and ideas from the Old Testament and bringing them over in the New to show you how they're being fulfilled in Jesus and in the world we live in right now and the world to come. So that's why. All right, so this is a little bit of follow-up on that. I know you said you didn't want to talk about, you didn't want to talk about something that we preached on, but that you did preach on this last week and it goes along with what you were saying. So if uh, the mark of the beast isn't literal, what, what's the Bible referring to uh, with not being able to buy or sell without having the mark? Yeah, so when I say the mark of the beast isn't literal, I mean it's not literally on your forehead, it's not literally on your hand. <laughs> Thank you I, for the I, That's all I meant. Next question. Yes. <laughs> what about the buying No, no, wait, wait. I mean, let's just go back to that. It's not, it's not literally on your forehead. It's not literally on your hand. I mean, are you gonna stand in line for 666 day? And go, yeah, put that on my hand. I mean, even the, most, even the most crazy against God people would never do that. It would be, it's just would be naive to think that. They're like, like, that Satan's going, they'll never get it. They'll never guess what's gonna happen. I'm gonna have them stand in line. We're gonna have them stamp 666 here and here. Uh, by the way, you know what it also says, if you keep reading Revelation, it says that you also have a mark on your head. It's the name of the Father and the Lamb. I don't see a mark on your head. But the Bible says that that's how we're denoted as followers of God. Now, listen, if at the end of the age, God's got a huge holy stamp book, I'll be the first in line. (laughs) But you have to understand, this book was written in the first century. John is looking at things in his life that he sees people doing. And so in his lifetime at Ephesus, you had to bow before the altar of, of, of of the Caesar and say that he's Savior and Lord. You had to commit idolatry. And you got a certificate all right, you got a certificate that said that you'd done that, that allowed you to buy and sell. It wasn't on your forehand, or it wasn't on your hand, it wasn't on your forehead, but it, was, it represent the mark of the beast. That means you're owned, you're, there, you're the beast follower, because you've already given, you've sold out Jesus. That's what it meant. That's what John saw, and he put that into Revelation, which was always the effect of the age. It wasn't just, in, it wasn't just with Rome, it's been in every part of the age, and it'll be to the end of the age. Um, I think it cheapens it when we say, well, it's only at the end of the age it's gonna be a literal mark. Again, you can, you can believe that if you want to. Um, if you just look at the historical context of when John wrote Revelation, it seems like he already was seeing that in his own lifetime. That's why he warns the seven churches of Asia Minor. Why would he tell them all this stuff if they're never gonna be there? That's what I would say. Hmm. But again, there's different views there. They're all wrong. Mine's the right <laughs> No, I'm... I'm all right, so speaking of the Lord, different views... Lord, you know I'm joking. You know I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of different views, how can I discuss different views with someone who believes that there's only one right position? God, not, you can't. <laughs> you can't. It's like talking to this water bottle. It's like, hey man, I know there's a different way to do this. And the water bottle's like, no, there's not. It's just this way. That's what it feels like. When you talk to someone, it's, it's interesting that uh, there are certain people that hold certain, <laughs> I'll, say, I'll try to say this kindly, which probably won't come out kindly. Um, there's usually just a handful of groups that, are so dogmatic, it's the people that are dogmatic about this that kills me and to kill you. That'll give you all their books. And all. Here's what's funny, I've studied more 
than I feel like most people I know about Revelation and the end times. I mean, and, I would, and I'm not trying to be boastful. I'm just saying I've probably done more work, I'd say, than most people do, most pastors do. And I'm more humble about this. Like, I'm not too sure I know everything on this. Story. I know I don't know everything. And what I do know, I, I feel like I have confidence in. But man, if I heard a different view, then it made better sense of the Bible, I'd change it in a heartbeat. That's how, that's how hard Revelation is. And so when someone comes to me and is like, I got it all figured out, here are the charts. I'm always leery of those folk because they're so dogmatic you can't even talk to them about another way. Because here's what happens. If you're a dispensationalist, premillennialist. If you're a premillennialist or historic premillennialist, you're an amillennialist or post, we can have a conversation. I'm like, listen, we can argue and debate about it, but I could be wrong. But then you'll talk to some people, it's like they believe it's the only way. Stay away from those folks because they're incredibly immature spiritually. And they don't know their history. They don't know church history. There have been a lot of God, you know like the first guy that said, I don't even believe in millennialism. Uh, I don't believe in a literal thousand years. It wasn't a dude last year, it was St. Augustine. St. Augustine, and you're like, who's St. Augustine? One of the greatest church fathers we ever had. He wrote Confessions, he wrote The City of God. It's The City of God where he's like, listen man, this whole literal thousand years is crazy talk. That was a church father that said that. Not some guy 130 years ago. We're talking a guy about 1800 years ago. So. When you know that, it's just, it gives you a little less hubris and a lot more humility to go, you know what, I could be wrong on this. So I think it's hard to talk with people about it if they're already come from the position of, I've already got it all figured out. Because if anything, even us, when we're going, you told me not to ask you a question, so I'm not going, I'm not going to. to. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, well, here's yeah. my question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if, if anything, we, have you noticed when we even work through Revelation here, we'll say, well, it likely means this. And scholars say this. And it looks like it's doing it because we're not gonna try to say with so much certitude, like this is exactly what it is, because it may not be that. But we've got enough pieces put together, we can make a really good, I don't wanna say educated guess, but we can, we can try our darndest with it. And all of a sudden, at least I, my perspective is, I feel like I know Revelation more than I've ever known it, uh, and, it's, and it's incredibly simple, the message. It's complex in how it's layered, but the message is pretty simple. Follow Jesus, stay faithful, don't become an idolater. Jesus is coming back to judge the living and the dead. Stay true to Jesus till the end, and he'll keep you true. That's it. You don't even have to come to the rest of these series. That's the whole story right there. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's good. Uh, question about cremation and the glorified body. So when you think about, yeah, being yeah, raised, man. glorified body, are Dang there right. any issues with being cremated? Yeah, he won't be able to find you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Are you gonna get cremated? Let's just say you are. He's not going to be able to find you. <laughs> Yancey's going to find you. Sure I'm going to be like at my ranch, yeah. boots up, like ready to go. I, mean, I was ready, Lord Ryan. I told him not to. Uh, so here's what you need to understand. <clears throat> I think Genesis 1 is poetic imagery where it says that God made us out of the dust because there's theological significance to that. Not because we're literally made out of dust, because we're made from the creation. We should know that we're part of the creation, that we're never going to be the creator. <clears throat> and yet... Even with that being said, if God can quote unquote make us from the dust, he can sure gather us from the dust once we've gone to it. So uh, a cremation, I, I don't wanna go too long on this because this is what I talk about with my systematic group. <clears throat> Excuse me, y'all. But uh, the, the Bible is not against cremation in and of itself, but it's against having a poor view of the body. So Christians believe that matter matters, that God is going to raise our bodies from the grave whatever they look like. By the way, it also says in Revelation that the sea gave up their dead. What do you think those bodies look like that have been there for 2,000 years? There's nothing there. So <clears throat> God will somehow, miraculously, obviously, reconstitute our bodies. But um, I think cremation is a viable option for Christians just as long as that you present at your funeral that the body means something. Like We're, we're, not, we're not putting this body under cremation because we don't care about the body. That's the stuff I hate. By the way, there are theological views that well, I just shared with you that have a very poor view of the body, they have a very poor view of the, of, of the earth, they think it's all just gonna burn up in the end instead of being renewed heavens and earth. <clears throat> so the body is important. And if you're gonna get cremated, God bless you. My parents are donating their bodies to science. That's how they feel like they can serve a higher purpose. And I think that's pretty noble. They asked for my permission. I thought, well, it's not my, you do whatever you want to do. But like, oh, you're the theologian. Make sure that, you know, I'm like, well, I don't know, man. It depends. If you've got some seven, I mean, some 22 <clears throat> year old kid working on you, I don't know if you're going to make it, dad. But, <laughs> um, but I just said at your funeral, we're going to talk about why we're doing this and that the body's important. 
And here's why we've chosen to cremate, blah, 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 blah. Cremation's been around. Christians in India do it. They did it somewhat early in the, the early church. It wasn't the dominant view, to be honest with you, <clears throat> because people knew that Jesus was gonna raise them. That's, y'all remember the catacombs? They, they, they stuffed those bones in there because they wanted to make sure they had them all in one place. Uh, I, I think God's okay finding you wherever your body is because your soul's gonna be with them anyhow. So uh, you can be like, Lord, I want that body. The one with the muscles, that's me. I, that's, that's how I died. <laughs> so, but yes, uh, cremation just well thought through and presented is, I think, legitimate. Others may disagree, um, but as far as can God reconstitute my body, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Where do we go when we die? <clears throat> do the different interpretations I don't know. answer uh, this on differently? What, no, say that again. <laughs> do the different interpretations, understanding of the millennium, uh, answer that question yeah, differently? Not, not generally they don't. Um, <clears throat> not generally they don't. What you guys may not understand is uh, when, when like the wicked die, they don't, they don't go to hell immediately. Hell's only mentioned in the last book. I was only mentioned in Revelation where it says that the devil and the beast are thrown in the lake of fire with their followers. That's where hell, that's Gehenna. Um, and I don't want to get too tripped up, and if you were in systematic, we, we, we could help you out here, but I'll just trouble you. Um, <clears throat> the Bible says that when you die, you go to the place of the dead. Sometimes that's known as Sheol. Uh, I think the Greeks called it Hades. That's why Jesus says in Revelation, I have the keys of death in Hades, because he, he's, he's, John's communicating to the people in his era. Uh, you go to the place of the dead. There's a place of the dead where the wicked go and a place of the dead uh, where the righteous go. Uh, what we understand from the New Testament, that place seems to be heaven for the righteous and for the dead. It just says the place of the dead where there's torment. And then it says that death and Hades give up their dead at the end of the age. And they go into a greater torment, this time bodily. Because there's a resurrection of the unrighteous as well. Y'all remember that? There's a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. So we get, we, I'm sorry, followers of Jesus get glorified bodies to enter into the new heavens and the new earth. And, and you can debate whether that's, you know, you have a glorified body or not in the, whatever you believe about the millennium. <clears throat> if you believe it's a literal thousand years, then you might, you might have it there. Um, but uh, the unrighteous also get resurrected. Both parties go to their eternities in a body to, feel the, to have the full experience of either blessing with God in fellowship or to have as God's wrath. Those are the two realities. And so I, I've even forgot the question. Oh yeah, Does, do, do those different views have different ways to interpret where you go when you die? Not, not really. Dispensationalists have a little bit of a tweak on some of that stuff, but not, they're all pretty much the same. So looking at the amillennial view, um, how do we understand Satan as being bound? Mm -hmm. So uh, Satan is bound, in the amillennial view, he's bound, bound because it's during the gospel age of what we're in now. Uh, they, would, they would argue that he's bound from deceiving the nations from hearing the gospel, which is true. Uh, Jesus says uh, in the Great Commission to go into all the world and share the gospel. Acts 1.8 says you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses, and that's exactly what happened. How many, how many nations came to Jesus or came to a gospel sense in the Old Testament? Uh, only one did, Israel. And maybe you could split it in half and say Israel, Judah, but no one else came. No one else came. No other nation came. Look at all the nations around. None of them came. In fact, they hated uh, Israel. And yet Jesus came, and all of a sudden, after Jesus left, the church started to explode. And it went to Judea, excuse me, went to Jerusalem, and then Judea, Samaria, Judea, and now to the ends of the earth. And uh, what an amillennialist would say is, you know, I'll tell you how that happened. Jesus bound Satan. Now, to bind him doesn't mean that he has no power. It means he's... he's He's limited in his capacity to hurt the church, and there's some truth to that. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 12, even in his own ministry, I, I, uh, what are you doing here with the kingdom? He says, you, you can't, you, you, um, they asked, how do you cast out demons? He said, you can't come into the strong man's house unless you bind him first. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 12. So he said, referencing the devil, he's bound him. Um, I'll, I'll give you a verse here, John 12, 31 through 32. Now the judgment of this world uh, excuse me, now is the judgment of this world, Jesus says. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. By the way, that cast out's the same cast out we see in Revelation. <laughs> and when I am lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all people to myself. All peoples will come when I'm lifted up. So we even see Jesus saying, I've cast out the devil. I've, I've, and, and, and actually, the word uh, cast out is the same word for being cast into the abyss in Revelation 20. Same word. 
that the devil's limited in his power to deceive the nations, and that's why gospel evangelism can work. By the way, it's why post-millennials, they, they really get on top of that. They're like, that's why it's gonna be a party, and then you can't stop the church, so much so that the church can be that successful. I'd like to believe that. I, I, I tend to have, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fight between two kingdoms. But that's, that's what they, um, that's what they, the, the amillennials would say. By the way, it's what Augustine said as well. He said when Jesus came, he bound Satan and threw him in the abyss for a thousand years. And then he said it wasn't a literal thousand, and he got all the people mad at him. <laughs> then he's like, but I'm Augustine. You do what I say. So he didn't say that. <clears throat> Maybe. When the new heavens and the new earth are formed, what will happen to the old heaven? <clears throat> yeah, well, I don't know, because uh, the Bible doesn't say much about it. Uh, not much. Oh, I'm sorry, not much. I'd say maybe quite a bit. If heaven is the realm where God specifically blesses with his presence that's unique. And Revelation 21 says that heaven and earth meet once again. So this is, this is, a, this is a throwback to Genesis 1. So we have paradise, paradise lost, and paradise found. Thanks, John. Was that Milton that wrote that? It's like John. Um, but what you have in Revelation is you have actually a better creation, a fuller redemption than what you have in Genesis 1. It's even better. It's not Adam and Eve with God. It's the whole people of God with God, the people of God with God. And it says that heaven and earth meet. It says, I saw a new Jerusalem coming down out of the heavens. And actually, the way that Jerusalem is described is actually the people of God, which is crazy. Because you know how we've talked about it. It seems like there's this, this, this heavenly copy to everything that we see on the earth. Like if there's the church here, they have the, six, the seven stars that represent the angels, of the, represents the church. You have all animate creation. You have these four living creatures that represent the creation. It's just crazy copies, if you will. And it seems like there's the same thing for the church. But it says at the end of the age, they all come together. And there's no sickness, nor death, nor hell. Uh, I mean, that's, that's where I'm shooting for. That, that's, that's why we're so bullish at Clear Creek about talking little about heaven and a lot about the new heavens and the new earth. You know how much the Bible talks about, so when you die, the, between when you die and Jesus returns, the theologians call that the intermediate state. It's kind of like, a, it feels like a halfway house in the sense that this, you're with Jesus in heaven, but you're not bodily, you don't have your body yet, right? <clears throat> Our souls are with them. And the Bible doesn't say much about it. You know why? Because it doesn't care. Paul doesn't care about it because it's not the end game. The end game is come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Why? Because Jesus comes for the fullness of his kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, all of those views that I shared with you, dispensational premillennialism, premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, they all have the same view. Jesus, at some point, starts the new heavens and the new earth that's the game. That's what Paul and these guys talk about all the time. Where do I go when I die and what's it like? Talks this much. In fact, Paul got caught up with what's called the third heaven. Remember, uh, I don't remember if it's Ephesians, Galatians. It's a book of, you not to ask me a question. Book in the New Testament. It's just a book in the New Testament. Remember when Paul has this vision and he says, uh, now in the ancient world they thought heaven was, the, they talked about heaven in three ways. The atmosphere is the first level uh, space or the stars is the second level. By the way, they thought the earth was a dome. That's what they did back in the day. I'm looking at you like you're going to tell me that they were, but they did. And you remember it's called the firmament? Neutral. The firmament? They thought it was fixed there because they didn't have rocket ships. They didn't have NASA. So, um, and then beyond that, they had celestial waters and then there was God up in his heaven. That was called the third heaven. So what, is, what does Paul say? He has a vision. He says, I had a vision. I was caught up to the third heaven. Like, what would happen to the first two? They didn't say that. They knew exactly where he was at. He was with God in, his, in, in the fullness of his kingdom. And Paul returns. He says, and I was permitted not to tell you anything. I can't tell you what it was like because you'd want to go right away. So when you see these people that have these books that say they went to heaven and can tell you about heaven, it's weird they got permission, but the apostle Paul didn't. Paul says he wasn't permitted to do it. You know why? Because he didn't have the authority to do that. Only Jesus has that authority. And he locked that thing up. Now all he's doing is breaking seals. So um, I just want to get on around. I need to stop. So next question. All right. <laughs> this, this one's probably my favorite. Oh, no. This is a good one. I don't know who did it. It's anonymous, but here we go. It's anonymous. Those yeah. are my favorite ones. Well, a lot of these are, just because it's a hassle to put in, in your name. Why does this matter? <laughs> It's a hassle to put in your name? Yeah, you know, oh you gosh. have to type in Such things like that. Yeah, so the question is, why does this matter? As in, if we are open-handed on this issue, why spend so much time, energy, effort, resources on this topic for weeks? Uh, yeah, I, I would say this. Uh, I would say, yeah, that guy's alive for the party right there, isn't he? Hey, man. 
It got, it got votes. It got yeah, votes. I know, I'm sure. Invite those guys to the Christmas <laughs> shindig. Uh, uh, here, here's what I'd say. Um, let's see, how, many, how long have we been to church, Ryan? Founded in 1993. 28 and a half years. 28 and a half years, we've only done Revelation once. There's your answer. We've done Revelation once in 28 years. So we spent all this time not talking about it because pastors are scared to preach it. They're scared because of y'all. <laughs> Because you got some views that somehow someone imbued in you because you got your teachers from your radio and your TV and whatever, but you've never done the hard work on it. And they do the hard work and they get up here and they just get railed on because they've actually done the work. And then when they do it, it so overwhelms them. I mean, I've wept more studying Revelation than anything else. Now, you and I have talked about it. Get weepy to think about what Jesus is doing. And uh, I, I wish I'd have done it sooner. I remember, t I've, I've told these guys recently, I'm like, listen, man, I was not gonna die and not preach this book, period. Because it's been a gift to Clear Creek. I, I, I don't know of another series we've done lately that's been this dynamic. Can I get a witness? I mean, listen. Um, so, uh, what, what we're saying is, I think what I said was, uh, the millennium, is not that important in the grand scheme of Revelation since it's got one passage. But we have all these internecine fights in the church about it because someone thinks they know something about it. But then when you actually look and talk about it, you can have some real constructive conversations. And I'm telling you, there are legitimate Christians on all four views, and they're godly people, and you would love them, right? And, and we're composed of that here, although I don't know of any post-millennialists. I want you, because you would never ask that question. You'd be like, when's the party? Because it's only gonna get better, right? And so uh, what I would say is, um, these are things that, well, listen, we said we're gonna add a form. Look how big it is. People wanna know. The problem is people don't wanna talk about this. And we just said, we're not gonna do that. We're here to shepherd people, and we're gonna tell you stuff. I joked about, like, I'm gonna say stuff just makes people mad, but I, listen, I'm more committed to following Jesus and serving you and telling you what I think is the truth. And, so, and doing the hard work for that. I gotta be held accountable to God for what I say. And so does Ryan, so does Bruce and everybody else. And so we thought, you know what? We're gonna be held accountable for what we don't say. Let's go get into Revelation. Let's go get it. And so we did. All right. Give me something else fires me up. All Come right, on. yeah, man. We, should, we, hey, we still got, we're, we're doing pretty minutes. well. Yeah, we're doing well in time. I don't know All what right. we're doing. Let's sing a song. Yeah. <laughs> no, let's not do that. Yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> I'll do that. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not gifted. Yeah. All right, so what do you think about the idea that most of the prophecies and visions and revelation were fulfilled within the first few centuries after the book was written? That's what a preterist would say. Some of you don't even know what that means. Most of you don't. So preterism is this idea that Jesus fulfilled most everything. Revelation, most, all of revelation has been fulfilled within the first century. It's called preterism. Preter means, in the Greek, I believe it means like full or complete. If it doesn't, I don't know what it means. I thought that's what it meant. <clears throat> so preterism is, um, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And when Jesus talks in Matthew 24 about the destruction, he does allude to the temple. And everything that's put in with the temple is also talking about not just the destruction of the temple, he also uh, loops in some things about the return of Jesus. And so a preterist, what's called a full preterist, believes that it all was fulfilled in the destruction of the temple, and Jesus spiritually returned to destroy the temple, and that's it, it's all been fulfilled. Okay, so most people I know don't believe that, even most theologians, are. they like that idea, but uh, you know, they do think Jesus is coming back, so they tend to believe what's called half preterism, which, uh, which basically says there's a lot of revelation that's already been fulfilled, which isn't really a crazy idea. The debate is when does it stop being fulfilled and when does it start having a fulfillment yet to be? That's the big debate. And so uh, I don't remember what was the, 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 the exact precise part of that question is. That, that's the real debate is, um, like we said from the very beginning, some people read revelation and everything's future. And I think that robs us from reading it to, well. Because there is a present reality that, I mean, <laughs> I don't even know why John would have written it to the seven churches if he didn't specifically want to mention them about what they had to do in light of idolatry. But notice that theme's carried all the way through the rest of the book, all the way to the end. And so um, other people say that it's all taken place. Uh, we have an eclectic view. We believe that some of it's taken place, some of it's going on now, and some of it's going on in the future. Um, and we also hold the view that it recapitulates. And I, I'm more convinced of that more than ever studying it because it's, 
We almost have to be creative when we do these. We've done today, so we finished the third set of three sevens. And if you, they, they almost all do the same thing. And it's not like God's bored, like, I don't know, do the same thing you did last time, you know? <laughs> just, just make it trumpets this time. And then after the trumpet, you know what, I'm tired, let's do the same things, but this time with the bowls. Um, it's, those, have, those are intentionally repeating themselves because they're seeing the same thing. And we see this all throughout Revelation. And, um, and what's crazy is that it makes the experience even richer because it gets a little deeper every time. So um, I don't know how to answer that specifically. It just depends on how you want to read the text. Uh, I got friends of mine just right down the road. They think the whole Bible, excuse me, the whole Revelation is futuristic. That's totally cool. Uh, we don't hold that position. Mm -hmm. I said that position. The teaching team does not come from that perspective. Yep. In the new heavens and the new earth, will we enjoy literal things like animals, pets, oh, man. and actual food? Um, it seems that, and I think Bruce is going to get into some of this, so I don't want to, I don't want to steal his thunder here, <clears throat> but it seems like, you know what the, heaven's, excuse me, not heaven, uh, and again, we can debate whether this is the millennium or not, it seems like the new heavens and the new earth are pictured as a great banquet, the marriage supper of the lamb, where we can eat and feast, and so if you could eat and feast in Genesis 1, I believe that you'll eat and feast after Revelation 21. It's the same bookends. You know there's the tree of life in both of them. There's the rivers through both of them. Waters. It's the same stuff and it's intentional. Actually, Genesis 1 is Eden is really a temple language. It says that you're to tend the garden. They're actually priests tending the priestly garden of the temple. That's what the language is in there. And guess what we have at the end of the age? The temple coming down, we the priests as well. So it's a fuller vision. It's not just Eden redone. It's like blown up with steroids. It's amazing. It covers the whole earth, right? And so what we have here is like, Everything there is physical. Our eternity is physical. Matter matters. And so I think, yes, we'll eat, and uh, will our pets be there? I don't know, man. I'm hoping they are. <laughs> Except for some two cats I had. I hope those, <laughs> hope they're in hell. Hope they're burning in the lake of fire. <laughs> I told you, you know what I'm gonna say. And he's like, ah. So, uh. That's really not true. I love my cats as well. But I, I, <laughs> can you believe that? What are we talking about? I don't know, but Pastor Andy said he loved his cats. Put that on Twitter. Um, here's what I would say. Um, the Bible does not tell us this. But if in the fullness of redemption, and it says that all creation groans, Romans says all creation groans for redemption, I'd like to think that the animal kingdom is a part of that. Uh, I don't have any specific text. It will not surprise me that uh, all of these animals will be there, minus mosquitoes. There's no redemptive purpose for them that I know about. <laughs> Can I get another witness for that? Yeah. All right, all right. Sorry, Jesus, I don't know what you could do with that one, right? But I, I like to think that, but I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. So how do we reconcile Jesus coming? Well, stop, let me Go just ahead. say this, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll tell you what's not true. There's not a rainbow bridge your pet walks across. <laughs> I don't know why y'all post that stuff like it's somewhere out of the Bible. There's only one rainbow, it's over, the, it's over the altar of God in Revelation five and six. It's not the rainbow bridge. I know that's what you mean, but it also feels like when someone dies, like, well, they're an angel now. No, they're not, they're not an angel. The Bible, you don't wanna be an angel. They get judged at the end. You wanna be a redeemed human, that's what you wanna be. Sorry, that was the theologian in me. I can't stand that stuff. I've had an animal die, he didn't get on the rainbow bridge. <laughs> we put him somewhere else. But I hope to see him in the end, so. Right. Sorry, man. Sorry. Thank People are going to be like, Yancy, my dog is on the bridge, is what they're going to say. <laughs> I'm telling you, you hate dogs. Nope. Love Jesus. Uh, all right. We're going to have to, yeah, we'll wrap this up soon. We're going off the rails You still here, don't want to yeah. do that. I told you. It's it was late. We got a couple I'm more I'm getting here. hangry. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get to eat this stuff. Yeah. All right. Uh, how, so how do you reconcile Jesus coming like a thief, being seen by those who love him, Yep. after his resurrection, and right. also coming on the clouds, presumably seen by everyone. Yeah, the thief stuff is just the, the speed in which it happens, the surprisingness of it. It's not like he's coming and he's gonna have a ski mask on. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, was that Jesus? Or was he just trying to steal my car, you know? That's not how that's is gonna be. Uh, Let's not go too literal with what's going on here. Jesus uses analogies and images. I'm coming like a thief in the night. Notice what he says, be ready. That's the point, be ready. Because it's gonna come when you don't expect it. That, that's why I get really crazy when people say I can predict when Jesus is coming back. Y'all just stop following those people. How many times do they have to be wrong? 
And well, you know what, Yancey, we're closer to Jesus' return than we've ever been. That's true every day we wake up. <laughs> You're getting older every day. Now listen, that's right. I'm going to see Jesus closer tomorrow than I did yesterday. That's true at any point. So um, that talks about, the thief talks about the speed, you need to be ready, that he comes on the clouds. Um, frankly, that's, that's messianic language from Daniel and Ezekiel, I believe. Coming on the clouds, that he reigns, that he's heavenly. It's like, like no, he's not coming today. If there's no clouds in the sky. You know, and it's not cumulus. You can't ride cumulus. It's got to be serious. It's got to be serious. It's, it's like we're, we're just over-interpreting stuff like crazy. That's where if you, if you try to literal everything, no one does that because it, you'll drive yourself crazy. Jesus is coming back. That's what you need to know. How did he leave? That's how he's returning. That's it. All right, final question here. Thank you. Yeah. I want to how would a belief in any one of these end times... Oh, really, I would say, how, do, how, do, how would a belief in all these end times help shape our evangelism? Oh, well, I mean, it was what we said today. They all have judgment at the end, period. We all know the clock's ticking. We just don't know when it strikes midnight. Because Jesus is coming like a thief in the night, we ought to be ready. But it needs to, we also need to be spiritually ready. It doesn't mean that you have to have your gym shorts and your sneakers ready, right? That's silly. You just need to be spiritually ready. You need to be loving Jesus and being a part of his kingdom and doing his kingdom work. I look at a lot of these faces, a lot of people I, I, I know are deeply embedded in the life of Clear Creek Community Church. Just keep, keep following Jesus. Keep serving him. And bring people into the kingdom. Because there is coming a day where Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. And I think someone had a question here is if you're a dweller of the earth, which is code language for an unbeliever, can you ever, can you ever get out of that? Is your fate sealed? No, your fate's not sealed, not as I understand it. I mean, Jesus says that we're to share the gospel with the world. So we want to bring people into the kingdom. So they, to me, I, when, you know, we're halfway, we're a little more than halfway through with Revelation. <clears throat> I was going to ask you a question, but I guess I won't. But, um, I know for me, it's increased my desire to want to share the gospel with people because I feel the nearness of Jesus in the text. It's weird. Um, I, I feel in the symbols and in the imagery actually a greater presence of Jesus than I've felt in other texts just recently because I've never, I've never gotten to get in the room of Revelation. I never got there and tried to actually seek to understand. And then when you finally seek to understand, you're just in awe. Bruce and I were talking the other day. He's like, Yancey, I just want to worship. I just want to worship. And it feels like every time we end, like Jesus is somehow being worshiped at the end. There's this doxological element to Revelation. In other words, there's a, there's a praise and worship set almost at the end of every section. And there's a reason for that. Because the, he is our king who's coming back to make all things new. And we want to get as many people in there as we can. And not in some way we're punching tickets. We want to give them a better life. This is the life God created them to have. So I, I, I think uh, regardless of your millennial view, everyone's stacking hands on, hey, let's go, let's go share the gospel with the Bay Area and Houston and Texas and the U.S. and the world. Um, if anything, Revelation's just hyped me up more to do that. Because you're, you're seeing the end game. You're reminded that not just judgment's coming, which it is, but that, that Jesus is coming uh, to throw a party for this people for eternity. That's... that's that's good stuff. I want my friends that don't know Jesus to get in on that. Amen. It's good Amen. work. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you for all the work you put into tonight. You're welcome. Revelation. Thank you, guys. Yes. Thank you, guys. For being willing to sit in the hot seat. Yeah. So, hey, and thank you guys for being here tonight. I invite you to, to stand. You guys can be dismissed from here, but thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, guys. Hey, thanks for checking out this video. If you haven't yet, make sure that you hit subscribe down below and check out clearcreekresources.org where we have videos, books, and sermons on there as well as our audio podcast. Thanks for watching.